You know, at some point in every Christian's life, we find ourselves asking the question, why does God love me? I mean, in a way, we question our own love ability. And uh, contrary to the idea of self-esteem, I don't think that's always uh, an unhealthy thing to do. Because too often we think we're lovable for all the wrong reasons. I remember uh, <laughs> about 20 years into my marriage, I was uh, looking in the mirror after taking a shower and, and uh, getting dressed for the day, and I could see that uh, muscle tone was deteriorating. I was putting on weight. I wasn't as fit as I was when I was younger. Um, and yeah, I hadn't been exercising for a while, but I confess that as well. But nonetheless, and I looked myself in the mirror and I said, oh my gosh, I said, I feel like I, I look terrible. And my wife, as she turns her head to walk out of the bathroom, just says back to me, I never married you for your looks. <laughs> and I was, I was kind of like, what? You know, and, and I, I, thought, I thought it was just my animal magnetism that she couldn't resist. But here she is, she's pointing out the fact that not that she didn't love me, love me, but really the reason for love was not anything as frail and fragile as physical attractiveness. Um, you know, I've, I've never been cursed with beauty, so I guess that's okay. But the reality is that God doesn't choose me because of any of the kind of things that I think God would want. He doesn't pick me from my intellect to him. I'm, I might as well be a total, uh, totally disabled in my mind. He didn't, he didn't choose me because of my physical abilities, because I don't have that many. I mean, I, I can go through the list of things and I, I say, well, what is it that God would like about me? And that's not so unhealthy because what it does is it, it causes us to despair in ever being uh, really attractive to God because of what we do or who we are or how we act or how we don't act. It's not a behavioral dynamic. It's not a, it's not a, a mental, intellectual, uh, talent, skill dynamic at all. Those things are not essential to God loving me and choosing me as his child. Now, I don't wanna say that talent, skill, and those things and intellect play no part in our life. But all they are is once we are redeemed, they are tools that God can use and motivate and shape and form and control for his glory. Because before we're saved, we use all those things for our glory. And in doing so, we end up becoming subject to the will of the devil, the spirit that's really controlling us without us really knowing it. So what is the deeper reason for God's love for me? Well, he says in verse 4, because of his great love for us, okay, I get it, God has a love for me, and it's not just a, a, a love love, it's a great love, a magnificent altruistic love. It's that, that agape love, the agapao love that God has for, or we often call it agape, but it's this, this uh, love that God has that's based upon him, not me. He loves because that's his nature. He doesn't love me because of mine. He loves me in spite of my nature so that he has this great love for me and it's based upon two things. Number one, he says, who is rich in mercy. Now, the two words that we find are, are equal, but there are different sides of the same coin is mercy and grace. Mercy is God not giving what I deserve. God in his great mercy in other words, when, when I believed on Jesus, the blood of Christ became, became sufficient payment for my sins, and he said, therefore, I'm going to extend to you mercy. I like to point out to people that we're never innocent. We're, 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 we're uh, acquitted, but we're never innocent. We, innocent means you never sinned. Jesus is the only innocent, truly perfectly innocent person who ever lived, which made his, uh, his murder, his execution, such a travesty of justice. But it was the greatest travesty of justice in the history of the world that was required to pay for my life, which was in many ways a constant travesty of justice, a constant life of willful and sinful disobedience, even when I did it ignorantly. And so what he says is because he had so much mercy in him to overlook all of that because of what Christ did, he made us alive. And that's where I remember in, on, on Monday, I talked about how that we're not dead in the sense we died, but rather we've been never made alive, we're dormant. And he says, suddenly he breathed into us, we were born again. He sp sent the spiritual sperm of the Holy Spirit to awaken that, that, that dormant egg of the soul. And it suddenly became uh, alive and began to grow in relationship with Christ. He says, because even as we were dead in our transgressions, and then he says, it is by grace you have been saved. So mercy is not giving me what I deserve, but grace is giving me 
what I don't deserve. I remember years ago, I asked a, a, an older pastor, a friend of mine at the time, uh, how do we balance grace and works? And he thought for a moment and he looked at me and said, here's your problem. You don't understand what grace is. And I thought, well, I'm a pastor, I should. He says, no, you have to understand, it's all of grace. Grace is imbalance. And that's the thing that we wrestle with because when we come to Christ, we're in an imbalanced relationship in a sense that I, I deserve nothing except wrath and yet here God is giving me blessings. So mercy keeps me from getting the wrath. Grace is where the blessings of God are bestowed upon my life. And so what we have to understand is that when we became children of God, we became objects of God's grace by which he chooses to bless us. God chooses now to bestow upon us his favor. So that when we ask us, why does God even care about me? In verse six, Paul goes on to explain. He says, God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So in God's eyes, we're already sitting on our heavenly throne. We're already there. We're, Jesus is probably on his throne, the Father and the Holy Spirit, they're the Trinity, they form that really the, the major throne, but there are minor thrones beneath them, and that is his church, that is you and me, that he seated us in, in a seat, that we are the sons of God. And he says, and he, he did this for one reason, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. In other words, to show that his grace exceeds anything else of goodness that's ever been done. The greatest thing that ever been done, the greatest good is that God showed us his grace. And then he says, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So let me uh, kind of wrap all of this up this way. That some of us feel like because we're not perfect and because we have failings that, that we're always kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop when it comes to God. That uh, if you were like me, I had a lot of childhood experiences where I would have something given to me with one hand and then it would be taken away by the other hand. And uh, that kind of creates a, a psychological dynamic, you know, that as a child, that's a kind of a form of child abuse, but the simple fact is it twists the way you think so that you're always expecting the backhand. You know, you're always expecting to let the other shoe drop and then you're gonna find really what's going to happen. And that fear is what robs us of our peace, it robs us of our joy. And when we're robbed of our joy, we're robbed not of our victory, but our ability to celebrate our victories. And that's, that's the critical thing, is that I find many Christians have very little celebration in their life because even when God does something really wonderful, they live in fear of, okay, that's great, but what's next? And they're always living in the fear of the future, not being able to rest in the fact that God has already conquered the future and he's let it, laid it down at your feet and he says, you can walk on this and you'll know my joy and my victory. Does that mean we'll always be rich, wealthy, and healthy? No, it doesn't. It, it has nothing to do with that because what that does is that's really exalting the life in this world as being the most important thing when God repeatedly tells us it's eternity that's the most important. That's my destiny. That's where the rewards are come. Anything I get in this life is all gravy. I mean, I just say, I don't deserve this, but thank you, God. And I'm going to rejoice and enjoy the things you've given me. And I'm going to weep with those who weep, but I'm going to rejoice with those who rejoice. Because none of those things are final. None of those things are forever. But what is forever is the inheritance that he has me in the heavenlies. And so he's bestowed this unbelievable grace upon us. And I would simply say that if, if you listen to these devotionals and they're helpful for you, I mean, they encourage you and, and clarify and whatever else I would hope that they would do. Uh, you know, as I often say, that they'd lead us into becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. If these devotionals do that, you need to understand something very clearly, that the only reason that happens is because the grace of God has chosen to speak into my life and through my life and into your life. Uh, it's the grace of God. And, you know, beyond that, I'm just a mumbling, babbling idiot with really not a whole lot to bring to the table. But God says, by my grace, my kindness towards you, I bestow good things. So here's the thing that really focus on in our minds. Try this really hard today to remind yourself that God wants to show me his kindness. God wants to bestow his blessing on me. I want to learn how to live in anticipation of the blessings, not in fear of something that will go wrong.
but rather that God is going to bless me. And, and, and regardless, I want to be that guy who lives in that confident state of being with Christ Jesus. We'll pick this up tomorrow. It's been fun talking with you and look forward to it in Jesus' name.